Not fewer than nine people requested Spinosaurus, and we had better do Spinosaurus. It's fortunate that we didn't do Spinosaurus before now because in September 2014, there was a really exciting study published uh, filling in a lot of the gaps in our knowledge about this dinosaur. And it's just really exciting to, to dig into all of the things that we thought we knew about Spinosaurus are now moot. <laughs> so, this is consistent with the earliest reconstructions of Spinosaurus that we have, which is basically a generic theropod, like what you'd see in a B-movie attacking a city, um, just with a sail on its back. This one even has a little horn on its head to represent the crest that we know it had, but that has never been a really rigorous approach to restoring Spinosaurus. Um, the very first uh, uh, restoration of the skeleton based on the scattered remains that um, Stromer was working with in 1915 looked something like this, but now that we have so much more material to work with, we can, we can throw out a lot of that. And I keep mentioning that we didn't have much material to work from, so let's break that down a little bit. In 1912, in Egypt, the, the Baharaya Formation specifically, Ernst Stromer found fragmented remains of Spinosaurus. And the problem was, during World War II, the museum where those bones were stored got bombed by the Allies and we lost the specimen. But then in 2009 through 2013, there was a new specimen from Morocco that was something like 40% complete. And, and the 2014 study based on that specimen is, is what I'm drawing from in, in the restoration here. And 40% doesn't sound like a whole lot to, to successfully reconstruct an animal from, but workers have been very clever, really, about filling in the gaps with related genre, because we know that certain animals like Suchomimus and Baryonyx uh, and uh, Ichthyovenator are what's called Spinosaurids, which is the branch of Megalosauria that is closer to Spinosaurus than to Megalosaurus. Megalosauria, in contrast, is a separate branch of the Neotheropods from the Allosauroidea. So restoring this in the classic theropod stance and with classic theropod posture is really unfair, because it's not that closely related to what we usually think of as theropods. The fact that it's related to Suchomimus, um, which means crocodile mimic, uh, should tell you some things about the anatomy of these animals. Spinosaurids do show some, what we would normally consider crocodilian traits. And you might ask, well, why would it exhibit crocodile-like traits? Weren't crocodiles around for that niche? Well, yes, but the Baharaya Formation and the Kemkem Formation in Morocco, which are from about the same time, and they're both from North Africa, obviously, um, are from the very latest portion, or most recent portion, of the early Cretaceous, which is also called the Lower Cretaceous. This was a time when sea levels were impossibly high uh, like, most of Europe was underwater. Europe was basically a series of archipelagos. North Africa had vast wetlands all along its coast, and we figure that that's where Spinosaurus existed, and it actually fills in some, some of the riddle that we have with fossils from that area, because we find Spinosaurus, which is an enormous carnivore. We find Carcharodontosaurus, which is an enormous carnivore. We find um, Baharayasaurus. These are all large carnivores, and we only have like medium-sized to small herbivores, and we don't have that many of them, and that's 
not very consistent with what we know about how ecology is supposed to work unless there were different niches for the different super predators. And that's exactly what we figure there, there was because Spinosaurus with its crocodilian type adaptations appears to have been adapted for water life. That is, it was semi-aquatic. A semi-aquatic lifestyle is not something we've really seen in dinosaurs before. In fact, that's something that I've kind of been trying to shy away from on this show because the very first restorations of dinosaurs we had were that they consistently lived in swamps. And it wasn't until fairly recently that we were like, oh, actually these are extremely adapted uh, land creatures. But here we have the reversal of that, and that's pretty exciting. Remember that crocodilians are themselves descended from terrestrial adapted archosaurs, so it's not that much of a stretch that we would see a, a more derived theropod returning to the water as well. And it's not that much of a stretch that it would exhibit some of the traits we see in water birds, in early whales, and in crocodiles. This toy has a somewhat barrel-shaped torso on it, which what you usually see in a theropod would be a, a, a deep chest with a, a sort of an oval cross-section, whereas Spinosaurus was kind of a rounded-off trapezoid. Uh, which suits a, a, an aquatic creature, as does the length of the torso. This is entirely too short. Uh, it, it had what looks like an absurdly long torso. Um, we don't have as much of the tail as maybe we would want, but the inference from related genre and the bones that we do have indicate that as we lengthen the torso, we should also lengthen the tail. And furthermore, this head is completely not a Spinosaurus head. It's, it's a sort of Allosaur head with a spike on it. Now, the, the spike is, I suppose, accurate. It, it had a little tiny crest. It was more like a, a rooster's comb than a, an actual, like, Ceratosaurus-like spike. And it was much higher on the head. It was, it was at the top of the nasal bone. The eyes were at the very back and very top of the skull. And once you get into the actual jaws, the skull is extremely long and extremely narrow. It's not that short, like top to bottom, but it's, it's very narrow side to side, which means for predation purposes, it probably couldn't twist the way a crocodile does, and it probably wouldn't be very useful in a fight against like a, a, a land-based herbivore, but that's excellent for snagging fish and biting down on them. Also useful for snagging fish is moving the nostrils back on the skull, much higher up than the tip of the snout, which is where they're portrayed here. And the teeth. This, this guy has these sort of classic lips, and as far as we know, it, it didn't have such things. When it had its mouth closed, you would be able to see the teeth interlocking. It had very crocodilian-looking teeth. It had, they, they were conical, and they weren't serrated. It had a crocodile-like notch, kind of like the one we saw in um, Dilophosaurus in, under the prolaxilla of its jaw, and it had a corresponding lump in, in the dentary bone. The teeth at the front of the promaxilla were very long, then there were very short teeth in the notch, and then long teeth again, and you see the opposite pattern in the lower jaw. So what this does is it, it creates sort of a trap, and, and even if it can't close its jaws all the way, those teeth at the front of its mouth will trap anything that happens to be struggling in its jaws. So we're seeing a really useful tool for snapping up the car-sized coelacanths and the giant saw sharks and, and, and just the, the really large fish that, that were in the, the tidal waters of North Africa in the middle of the Cretaceous. And one interesting thing that we only recently started studying about the snout is that at the tip of it, where there weren't nostrils, remember, there were these, or are, these holes in, in the, the front of the permaxilla and on the sides of the permaxilla. And we figured that these are actually pressure sensors. So it could sort of sit with its nose in the water, being able to breathe because its nostrils were so high up on the skull and sense pressure changes in the water as fish approach and then snap. When you're preying on fish that big, it makes sense to have a skull that is as big as me. 
which means that the total length of this guy is absurd. It's, it's like a 50 foot long creature uh, for the largest specimens we have, which yes, is much larger than pretty much any uh, uh, theropod we have. It's definitely longer than T-Rex, for instance, but maybe not so much heavier. The reasonable estimates for weight are hard to get for fossils for various reasons, but somewhere between five and seven tons seems to be quite reasonable, which is what you would expect for a shorter theropod. The 2014 Ibrahim and Sereno study, well, Ibrahim Sereno and a bunch of others study also looked at the histology of the bones and they found that the density is greater than what you would see in other theropods. That is that the cavitation, the, the, the air pockets were smaller, which is weird for a giant land creature, but for a water creature where you're not as worried about saving weight, the increased density of bones helps keep you more stable when you're moving through the water. And this is an adaptation that we see in water creatures. Penguins is a good example. They have dense bones, but the aquatic adaptations don't stop there. These legs are too long, <laughs> very much too long. The, the, the legs on Spinosaurus were only a little bit longer than the, the oversized for a theropod arms. The hip was small. The, the femurs were short, but fairly robust. It, it was heavily muscled for those little legs that it had. The feet were very small, not, not much bigger than the hands, maybe half a meter long for the Moroccan specimen. They've only given it three toes on, on this toy, but it the fourth toe that is usually just a dew claw on theropods was quite long and it seems to have been able to walk or swim with it. The feet are flatter than land adapted theropods and, and the claws too are lower and, and they have flat bottoms on them. This seems to be an adaptation for wading through unstable substrate, uh, 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 trying to walk on top of the muck. Ibrahim et al. also suggested that the feet were webbed, which is an interesting speculation. It would definitely make it a stronger swimmer, but the musculature of the legs indicates the ability to move in the water, as would the tail. The, the, the tail could also be an adaptation for swimming, as with crocodilians. The proportions on the arms are not bad. The, it did have proportionally enormous arms, at least compared to the theropods you might be used to. It's in the Spinosaurids, Baryonyx is probably most famous for having these enormous muscular arms with huge claws. Spinosaurus had something like that going on. It didn't have five fingers though. It had three fingers and the first finger had the longest claw and the second two had smaller claws, but those smaller claws were like the size of my hand. <laughs> this was quite a large creature. It's like th other theropods could not pronate its hands downwards. Its hands would have had to face each other, which makes it difficult to imagine how it could move around on land. You see with those short legs, that incredibly long torso and, and just generally the build of the creature suggests that its center of gravity, center of mass, I should say, is not at the knee, which is where it needs to be if it's going to walk bipedally. It's been suggested again and again over the years that Spinosaurus might have been what's called a facultative quadruped. In the 2014 study, they're proposing that it was an obligate quadruped, that it could only walk around on land using all four limbs. That doesn't mean, as I alluded to in the very beginning, that doesn't mean that it couldn't rear up onto its hind legs but it probably couldn't walk like that, at least not on land. They've reconstructed it knuckle walking effectively, which is not something that we've seen in other theropods, but neither is anything else about Spinosaurus. So it'll be interesting to see if that's borne out once we have more material from the actual wrist itself. There's a related dinosaur called Sigomasasaurus from the same time period and the same formations as Spinosaurus. In Spinosaurids, we see neck vertebrae at the, at the base, uh, uh, the, that is the last cervical vertebrae, are very flexible, they're very bendy. Sigomasasaurus takes this to an extreme, and Sigomasasaurus is actually a junior synonym of Spinosaurus, that is, they're the same creature. And that would imply that Spinosaurus could hold its head, in fact, would have to hold its head in a pretty extreme S-curve. There's a gentleman 
by the name of Andrea Ka, who, who does a, a really good breakdown of this on his Therapata blog. And this pelican posture is interesting because holding it further back would actually move the center of gravity of the creature backward, which might make the rearing I mentioned earlier a little more feasible. And last but not least, we come to the sail, which is what the dinosaur is named for, Spinosaurus, spine lizard. It is pretty much always restored like this. It's, it's sort of a chameleon looking structure in, in older restorations where you've got the radiating, narrow, really fragile looking uh, spines projecting from the back with narrow webbing basically between them. A perfect curve or semicircle and not very tall. The only detail from that that is accurate is that they do radiate outwards. Um, the actual form of the spines is, is, it looks like spoons to me, actually. It's got this wide portion at the base, then very narrow and gently flouting outwards towards the, towards the tips. Really, none of them are straight. They're all curved slightly, and none of them are directly perpendicular to the, the vertebra that they spring from. More importantly, they're enormous. The, the sail on Spinosaurus is like one and a half times the vertical height of the rest of the torso. They're, on a fully grown specimen, the spines would be eight feet high. I would be able to stand on the creature's back and reach up and touch the top of its sail. And I made myself sad because I'll never get to do that. They're often restored with these keratinous little claw-like bumps or, or, or armor-like bumps on the tips of the spines, and I see no reason why not. The actual surface flesh of the sail would be pretty comparable to the rest of the creature as far as we know, except that it makes sense for it to be a different color. It makes sense for it to be a display structure. See, from the very beginning, even Stromer uh, uh, toyed with the idea that it wasn't actually a sail structure like a chameleon. It might have been a hump, and that's been popular occasionally. But when we look at the surface texture of these spines, we don't see the rough surface that you would expect if you had fatty tissue attached to it, nor do we see the extreme amount of blood vessels that you would see if it was for thermoregulation, which really only leaves a display structure as the explanation. Oh, I forgot to mention, it's totally not a perfect semicircle. It has this, it, it's sort of a soft M, the, the middle spines are shorter than the, the ones immediately before the sacrum and the ones in the middle of the, the dorsal vertebrae. So it's a really distinctive looking sail on this guy. Not quite as distinctive as say ichthyovenators, but then what is? And you might ask, why would a creature develop and waste all of those calories maintaining this enormous structure that serves no functional purpose other than display? Well, if the animal is spending all of that time mostly submerged in the water, the only indication that it's there is going to be this sail poking out. And if that's the way that you indicate this is your territory, I am a healthy adult Spinosaurus, there's going to be selection pressure to have a bigger sail. So if you happen to see people on the internet, perhaps, complaining that Spinosaurus used to be a cool theropod that was basically just T-Rex with bigger arms and a sail on its back, and now it's lame because it's basically an aquatic hypercarnivore. Tell them they're wrong and that it's way cooler that it's occupying this niche that other dinosaurs just wouldn't even bother with. And that about covers everything I want to say about Spinosaurus, other than Nova and National Geographic made a really, really good documentary about the history of paleontology about Spinosaurus, as well as a detailed look at the new 2014 study. They, they talked to Sereno and Ibrahim, and you should totally seek that out because they have really cool animations of the reconstructed Spinosaurus, and they talk about how like they used ZBrush and, and CNC machining to actually produce the, the full-sized replica skeleton that they have on display now. Um, and that's really cool to me personally, that 3D modeling software is being used in a big way in paleontology. 
Thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Go to thegeekgroup.org to find out how you can become a member and donate. We are open to the public. You can come visit us. You can send me a toy dinosaur. Our address is in the description. And we'll see you next time. If you've only seen our videos, then you've only seen the smallest fraction of what the Geek Group is. It's a place where you can craft, improve on, manufacture, repair, rediscover, test, discuss, research, and share just about any project in a one-of-a-kind massive facility with tools and equipment you might otherwise never get the chance to touch, let alone use for your own projects. The Geek Group is a learning institution. We're people with different skills, backgrounds, and perspectives, figuring out how to make ideas a reality and sharing those insights with everyone. To help you along the way, and to get help from you, are tens of thousands of members from around the world connected to the lab in real time through internet relay chat and live streaming video. A single-minded appetite for knowledge and a drive to create are traits common to all geeks. We found a way to amplify those traits, a way to give you the resources you need to improve lives. Get involved at thegeekgroup.org. We thank the Future Girl Foundation for the grant that made these videos possible. GIMS! and the thousands upon thousands of purchases and private donations from members and viewers like you that keep this place running. Thank you.